I, d I don't know of any propulsive effects of low energy nuclear reactions, cold fusion, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Can you give us just a little bit more of a hint of what you mean by his movie real to be non real? <laughs> Him being Hutchison. Um, I can. Uh, in we came to know John in about 1980, and at that time he was, uh, you might say, mentally sick. He was on a number of uh, antidepressants, and at the time, what, at Valium and things like that. He had a severe agoraphobia. Uh, he could not be outdoors. All of his work was done in very close quarters. And when you went into his little basement of the house he was in, um, he had stacks of surplus uh, military equipment, which you could barely get into. Uh, everything had to be very close to him. And he was able in those, those days to produce effects that I've never seen anywhere else and with ridiculous instruments like spark gaps and, and uh, uh, little Van de Graaff machines and little uh, radio transmitters that when you look at the waveforms as we did, there's absolutely no relationship in anyone's theorizing between the apparatus he had and the effects that occurred. As time progressed, um, he and our associate, uh, association with him dwindled and then pinched off to nothing because we ran out of funds and we could never, we ourselves could never independently reduce, reproduce the effects. Um, other people who knew about the work started to come in and want to make money. They figured that he would be their ticket to untold wealth. They started promoting him. His, he actually got off drugs. He started to become a media hound, a media personality. Uh, lots of interviews on television, then on the internet. And the, the more he got, quote, better, in things, ways we define as better, you know, he's more socially acceptable. Um, he did things that you'd think you'd do if you were looking for money or you're looking for uh, some kind of uh, uh, so, some, something to say, John, you're a good guy. You've actually done stuff. The longer that went on, the less he was able to do the original work that he did. And eventually he wasn't able to reproduce them for these new companies who came and were set up and for him and tried to capitalize on him. Does that approach you, your question? Yes. Okay. So, um, we, th there are a number of uh, issues that uh, we have to keep in mind. Um, the one that I'm going to, or the, the areas that I'm going to talk about, I hope, if we have time, are the uh, prosaic and artifactual ex explanations, um, requirements for control experiments, et cetera. Um, next, please. The bulk of <clears throat> what I'd like to say uh, today has to do with these areas. Um, and the Nightmares in the Art of Measuring was a, ta a title given to a talk by Zinser, the guy who did that water, the zigzag um, electrodes in water. He introduced uh, me to a subset of what I'm presenting here about trying to codify all, as many areas, I should say, as possible about the experimental method as regards force and thrust measurements. Um, 
And I've had much help from a bunch of people in this room and other places in putting this list together, which I'm going to go through as quickly or as in depth as you wish and as time will allow. I've divided measuring uh, problems into these uh, areas, and there's uh, an additional one in on the bottom. Um, so let's go through some of these, and this is in order to, uh, no, John has to like, disappear. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's all right. You might mention the little the battery power thing that you did. I have to, okay. <laughs> John. Before, I, but I have to go. Well, I, I will do that, actually. Someone remind me of the little battery powered thing that I did. <laughs> uh, that is in probably mechanical effects. Um, I'll try to relate that to an actual, well, I'm relating it all to actual experiments. But I'm bringing these up now, as Lance has suggested, and I talked, uh, at least discussed in email, that it might be prudent for me to talk now rather than in halfway through this uh, three-day seminar so that you can keep in mind some of these issues that I'm bringing up when you're talking about instrumenting and experimenting with the kinds of thrusts and uh, propulsive effects that we're hope will need to be done. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So here's a small list of some thermal effects that should be taken account of uh, when doing experiments of, uh, of the type we're talking, especially when the thrusts are very small, which they now have to be given the kinds of new theorizing that uh, is being done. Um, a lot of this has to do with, uh, with the experiments that we did on the Podkletnov um, apparatus having to do with cryogens and, and uh, thermal differences uh, in, in um, materials that will cause a balance to, or, or a, 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 uh, an instrument to give a false or prosaic reading simply because of an unforeseen thermal gradient problem. Um, all of this, by the way, will be available. I, I have it on a, in that computer now, and so it will be, Heidi will be able to take it. And, and hopefully you'll be able to at least scan through some of these uh, when when you've done an experiment or considering an experiment so that uh, at least you'll have it in mind as a, as a thing that might creep up and bite you. Um, where is, you know, is John's, uh, we'll see whether I can get John's out of here. Anyway, I don't know whether I need to go through all of these unless there are uh, in, in detail, unless there are particular questions about some of them. Yes, sir? Well, you know, bringing up the energy system, a little uh, cool fusion, I, I thought that might be a kind of a good sample for this sort of because there, there were some sort of results, but not necessarily cool fusion. So if you got a result, uh, what do you do then? Um, it depends on how you define got a result. Um, in cold fusion experiments, the, the principal problem has been the matching of the output to the detector system. And most detector systems are thermal detector systems uh, as opposed to uh, using CR39 or some kind of other uh, nuclear, uh, you, you assume something in the beginning, i.e. there is a nuclear reaction. Therefore, we will put a nuclear detector of some sort to, to determine whether this is a nuclear, something funny going on nuclear-wise. But what they're trying to do is get heat. And what they should be doing is putting, uh, is, is putting their experiment in a calorimeter which is matched to, like impedance matched to the experiment that they're, that, that's producing the energy. And a lot of times it's not. So for instance, and I stop me when my digression 
becomes too or overly digressive. But uh, I suppose a lot of folk have been following uh, Rossi's experiments. And uh, the most recent claims that Uppsala and, other, a couple, and one other group have, uh, have found that, oh man, they, we, we took this dog bone shaped thing and we heated it up and we looked at it with a thermal camera. And from that, we deduced that there was excess energy being produced. Uh, and for some reason, very little backlash to that approach uh, was, was published. People said, oh yeah, or so, so part of the population who were at all interested in this whole thing said, wow, there's this uh, university group that has used the high-tech camera in this uh, experiment and they've got all these reams of data and stuff and at the bottom it says, yes, we've got 26 to one uh, output to input ratio or whatever the hell it was. And another part of the population says, this is ridiculous. There's such a mismatch between the, the thing that is producing the effect and the detection apparatus that is detecting and measuring the effect, that it's, it's untenable. Any results are untenable. And I'm trying to, to show in some of these slides why it's really important to match the experiment to the detection, or the production of the effect to the detection of the effect, uh, so that it's reproducible, it's defensible. It, it, if it's just a, a, an experiment, a theory, a reasonable theory can be developed, or if there's a theory, the experiment can show predictions in that apparatus beyond the original, original claims. So anyway, um, all of this stuff, as I say, will be available uh, in electronic form uh, somewhere, but um, uh, are there any ones uh, see, standing out for me? Thermal noise and torsion fibers. A lot of this I had to put up with. And, and uh, so I have uh, firsthand knowledge of how some of these things can uh, bite you. David. David Mathis. Um, are you going to write this? No, it's free. I'm, I'm hoping people will build on it. I'm hoping by getting it out into the, into the open, and it's been published actually uh, already uh, with uh, 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 one of my co-authors, Harold Rice, in Germany. We published this in a, or a short form, a shortened form. Um, this is the, a longer form version, and by putting it out, I hope other people will add to it and say, oh yeah, I found this problem in my experiment, which is not on the list, let's add it to the list. And eventually the list can be available to everyone, all experimenters anyway, uh, who are interested in, in performing these experiments. Are you proposing, George, that they itemize and make sure that none of these effects in any experiment are... No, like I'm, not, I'm not proposing that they do anything. It's up to them to accept that, or to, to at least be knowledgeable about, about the fact that there are a myriad of effects that will bother you. I'd be delighted if that was the case, but that will make an experimental r report in, in you know, some peer-reviewed journal excessively long. If you say, you know, this is, these are all control experiments we did, and this is all, you know, we, we went through all these lists, and we did this and this and this, Usually that is, is, is when someone really wants to get in and reproduce the experiment. They will go to the experimenter and say, did you do this and this and this? And the experimenter will say, yeah, we did all that, but we just didn't publish it because I mean, it would make the paper excessively long. So I'm not suggesting that one has to go through all of these items or say Hathaway's list and say, we've done 90% of Hathaway's list. Um, that, uh, I don't think it would pass, uh, even that would pass 
um, the editors. I agree with you uh, on that. You can, you can publish everything you did, but you have to be prepared when somebody comes to you to criticize what you do to answer their criticism that you did those quite, things. Quite so. Quite so. Yeah, this is a, I mean, I, I'm just looking at this one of our mechanical effects, and I assume the other. Well, we'll go the through the rules soon. are just as comprehensive, but you know, these are extraordinarily important, even in the fact that the, you know, when I talk to the people where I work about that do you know DOD type of equipment testing, ultra sensitive balances and whatnot, a lot of these come up as how difficult it is to measure the kinds of thrust that are expected out of some of these advanced systems. But what I see here, thinking longer term, is kind of a kind of a preliminary checklist of what could go into a set of requirements or qualification requirements for if one of these systems actually ends up coming to fruition and being, you know, considered for yeah, use. Yeah, that, that would be is that, you know, goal. Because even on, you know, standard metal parts for rocket engines, they had EM testing. They got, you know, how does it react when you put a Sharpie on it? You know, I mean, things of that nature. And this is like a great preliminary list of things to identify. For it's all yours. Yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Um, if you're, a lot of, a lot of times uh, experiments are done in a particular kind of atmosphere, either the particular kind of atmosphere we're in right now, or an atmosphere of liquid, of, of helium, cold helium vapors, if you're doing superconducting experiments of liquid helium, or in liquid nitrogen, or in high pressure, high temperature gases. Um, there are, as, there's all sorts of different kinds of buoyancy effects, and, and that really came out strongly in some of the superconductor experiments where the actual superconductor was being measured, the weight of the superconductor, rather than a test mass above or near the superconductor. Um, and Harold Rice has done a lot of, of thinking about this uh, area and uh, from an analytical perspective, and one of our joint uh, papers was uh, how thermal issues, how the, the, um, the thermal dis diffusivity of the device, in particular the um, low temperature super, or the high temperature superconductor, even low temperature niobium superconductors as well, will affect how um, the buoyance, how, how buoyant they are uh, over time. It, it, diffusivity, you'd think, yeah, who cares about diffusivity? You're just heating the, or cooling the thing down, and then you're doing your experiment. Um, well, these things actually have uh, quite an effect. Uh, let's go on, please, because I'm going to try to wrap it up soon. Um, OK, well, there are probably questions. I, 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 please, uh, talk about these things if you wish. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of our experiments have to be done on, on uh, anti-seismic tables. In fact, the balance that I'll show you uh, in a little more detail that we're testing uh, gyms and other thrusters on, and I'm sure Nembo will talk about as well, uh, have to be free of seismic uh, influences from the environment. Uh, can never be totally free. Um, because, uh, because of the shock absorbing nature of, say, pneumatic uh, bladders and things do not get rid of all noise, but at least you have to know the spectrum, the frequency spectrum of the, of the, uh, uh, the noise absorbing and the, the seismic vibration absorbing material so that you can say, I'm working within this band of the noise spectrum and you can then justify a little better that, in fact, uh, you have removed that prosaic influence to a large extent from your experiments. And it's, it becomes a problem um, because, it, because of the nature of seismic vib anti-vibration damping does have frequency response. That's why I'm drawing this frequency thing in my in the air, and you can hit a resonance uh, with some of those, some of the experiments, um, and you can ring the, uh, the pneumatic system, and you'll get a false, a false output. Um, a lot of <laughs> vibrations from, uh, especially 
vi vacuum systems become a, a real problem. And so I'll, if you're lucky, you can design a vacuum system that does not need tubing. In fact, if you go back, if you remember Jim, the picture of Jim there struggling over a, something and there's this big red hose, the vacuum hose that is pumping down his, uh, his experiment. It'd be nice to get rid of that. So the best way we've found is to get ion pumps. And uh, then instead of having tubes or pipes that come from the vacuum system to your experimental chamber with these big hoses and stuff, you now put these little ion pumps on. First, you still have to rough down the vacuum system, but then you take physically valve off take off the, the hose, and you're left with these ion pumps, which just have some little wires, like or high voltage wires, which are much, much less problematic coming down to your chamber than these big hoses. By the way, that big hose is connected to an inch and a half thick uh, copper tubing, which runs along uh, down to the floor. It's clamped to uh, a large wooden structure that has lead weights in it. All the pipe along the floor, it's about six foot away from the vacuum pump. It's got lead weights against the, the pipe on the floor. So by the time you get to that rubber hose, you touch the hose, there's no vibration at all. You can feel vibration near the pump, but <coughs> when it goes along the floor that distance, we sort of distance it from the pump, and it comes up, and it's clamped to this wooden structure with all the lead weights. There's virtually no vibration by the time you get to it. And it's all on a floating table, too. Good. But I, I will ask, when is the last time you measured the frequency response of your hand <laughs> as, as a detector. <laughs> um, but yes, I, saw, I have the same, in my, in my version of, of Jim's balance, I have the same problem. I have, hose, I have not had to go. This balance is not at the sensitivity where I actually need to decouple everything or as much as possible. So I agree, I, I'm, I'm trying to, but I'm making a different point that at some point, if you really gotta be sen super sensitive, you do have to take account of that. So is it? Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that iron pumps, um, of course, the downside is that the pumping capacity is very extremely small. low. Yep. Yeah? So uh, another method which uh, proves to be very fruitful is that if you have a big pump, you can have also a cryo pump or whatever, pump down the whole chamber the very low pressure, then you have a big gate valve and you close up the chamber and then you have half an hour with very good vacuum yeah. where you can switch off everything to everything without any pump. So this is also another method which Absolutely. is very useful. Yes. Actually because you don't need the car punch, even with turbo punch you can get vacuum. Yes, and but the, so for half an hour you can work uh, quite the beauty of the crab pump is that um, the structure inside the crab pump is still cooled down so it will absorb any gas which is produced. So you still have the pumping effect, but yep. you don't need any no, external no, thing for that. That's correct. So, yeah. so you still have pumping, but no external yeah. So that proves yeah. very helpful. But well, with limited one. budgets, sometimes yeah. ion pumps are cheaper. <laughs> Four ion pumps are cheaper than one big cryo pump with a big gate valve. There was one other thing that we, we found that was actually quite. Uh, quite a, a good effect. We, we, I was in the room next door and I was complaining that the vacuum pump was too noisy. So Jim, poor Jim had to go out and buy some, <laughs> buy some pieces of wood yeah. and buy some uh, ceiling paneling with the foamy stuff to, to damp the noise down basically. And when we did that, it actually quieted the, the vibration as well. So his system actually, the noise dropped considerably. And there's that's <laughs> another, the acoustics the yeah, acoustics. another brilliant example of, of a hidden consequences of some action over here why, wow, that's not going to affect what's going on here, but you have no idea what the structure of the building, the, the seismic or the vibration structure of the building is. You, sometimes you just have to do it by guess and by gosh and do, you know, put an extra weight here, which is what we do a lot. Well, that didn't have an effect. Well, let's put an extra weight here. Oh, that, that started to either calm things down or make it worse. Uh, so making it worse is a good thing if you're experimenting because then at least you know where the area you have to concentrate on to make it better. Um, let's, let's go on. Please. Uh, now these, these area, areas I'm talking about here in gravitational diurnal are where you have really sensitive uh, experimental parameters. Um, and uh, 
for instance, tidal motions. What? Tidal motions? You're gonna, is that going to affect your experiment? Well, in fact, at, at certain really critical, I mean, down in the, uh, where would it be? In the, in the, in the, around the, in the low nano, uh, nanonewtons, that starts to make an effect or have an effect. Um, the, this one we, we're, we ran into actually at, uh, at uh, Hal Putoff's lab in, uh, in Austin. Um, some, they were doing ex an experiment in, um, uh, uh, with a sensitive Cavendish balance and couldn't quite figure out why they could never zero it. It would, you know, over uh, one, one week, um, they would be able to zero it at a particular uh, rotational position of the torsion fiber, and the next week they'd have to turn it around, and it turned out that um, people, uh, some, somebody had moved a cabinet, a uh, storage cabinet from one area to the other, it was about 20 feet away, and it affected their zero, the zero point, uh, position of their Cavendish balance. You think, why well, that has no effect, but actually when they calculated it, the sensitivity of the balance was such that it did, it, it did have this slight effect, this slight movement uh, in the in microns, but certainly was enough to affect their, uh, their final result. Next, please. Thanks. Um, this is one that fools a lot, too. Um, the, virtually all experiments that I know of have to be done in a vacuum of some strength or pressure or vacuum or goodness, depending on how you want to characterize it or other. And a lot of stuff happens if you're not careful of how your vacuum system is constructed, where the ports are compared to your movable apparatus, um, the pumping rates, uh, drift of, of molecular drift within the, uh, within the chamber during an experiment, you say, well, heck, we pumped it down and it was stable, at least from our, the gauge we put on the side, the thermocouple gauge or an ion gauge clamped to the side of the chamber, and that's got a steady reading, so there'd be no more transient effects. Well, in fact, you don't know what's going on inside the chamber. The chamber could be stratifying, the, the gases could be stratifying, uh, over time, longer term than what you think is a stable situation by means of your gauge. All your, the only thing you've got to look at is a gauge, you know, a meter here uh, on an ion gauge or some numbers flashing saying, yeah, we're down at uh, three times 10 to the minus six tor, and it's been like that for half an hour. Well, in fact, inside, there m might be a whole bunch of other stuff going on gas-wise, molecular flow-wise, that uh, will take a longer time to settle down. Um, anyway, that's just one component of this. Next, please. Uh, there are some Coriolis effects that uh, uh, may come into play. And uh, here's one that is a, a torque-related concern that comes up all, a lot, especially when you have a, a balance arm that is measuring something at the end of it, and you have a counterweight here. And a lot of, of backyard experimenters, at least, that are discussing propulsion or thrust measurements will have their, I'll defer to Jim here, their thrust producing device fixed like this in, let's say, 90 degrees or whatever to the balance arm. And so they see maybe this thing happening with their, their balance. And they forget that, in fact, the lever arm length is changing because this is a fixed angle. So what they should be doing is pivoting the thing so that you don't change the lever arm, 
And a lot of people, for, I mean, it's so simple, but people forget that. And then, the, but it's too complicated. I have to now make, you know, I, I've worked so long to get the knife edge or the suspension balance figured out for this ma the main part of the balance. Now I got to worry about doing the same thing for this end and this end. That's too much money. Too much. It, it takes too much time. Then, forget it. The, the the result's no good because this has happened and this has happened. It's uh, it's painful. Sorry, this is uh, valid if you are doing a long uh, running the test, right? If it's just uh, lasting some minutes, it should not be a problem, right? Uh, no, it should. It'll be a problem anyway. It's it's a you have to figure. Um, Depending on how you're doing the experiment, you have to make sure that um, the balance, uh, that this weight, I mean, it's, it's a counterweight experiment. You've got this mass here, or weight, and you've got what you think is this weight here. And no matter whether it's a transient effect or not, that weight has to swing. And so does this one uh, at all times during the experiment. That's entirely true, but this system also is uh, uh, not a robust uh, system, it's pretty bad because <coughs> look, look at the dynamics of this system. It doesn't have any stiffness. And, yes. and if you look at the questions of motion, then uh, its motion is mainly dependent on either on the damping or the friction that you have there. <coughs> and this is just about the worst properties that you can have because measuring damping or friction, anybody that knows, the Friction is a very nonlinear uh, uh, terrible effect. It's terrible. Yeah. So you know, for example, if you have a, 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 a torsional pendulum, for example, you have a very well-defined torsional stiffness, which is, which is a beautiful elastic property. But to have this the system like that, there you're really talking nice. about the knife edge. What yeah. you have there, friction and so on. It's a, it's a horrible thing. Depends on temperature. You have a if you have a fluid, some people say, okay, I want to put a the fluid there. <coughs> but because of the it also depends on temperature and so on. Is this, and then you look at the questions of motion, it's not, it's not a nice system. It's, that's absolutely correct. But you you can characterize it though, right? I mean, even by having a fixed system, and you can, you know, without your test device, you can actually characterize that motion. And that but way you, you can know characterize you it at, 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 the, at the fixed temperature. You can, and, yeah, at, at, as long as you characterize it at some level. But, but as, as, as uh, then, you saying, can, then you can take that out your, of here. Your, your, your labs are not at constant temperature. Because they, they, many, most of the time they're doing this at room temperature. And one, one day it's at this temperature and so on. They, yes, they, your, your using frictional constant will change. Right. And it, it, it's, it's a difficult one if you want to do a full analytical workup. Of, of the balance system. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Ronell is correct. The, one of the best ones that you can do is the uh, wire, the torsional pendulum. And I did one where I captured the entire wire on the bottom and created a tension along that wire and set that tension on about 18 pounds. And in the middle of the wire is where I have the, the device and I have carbon fibers. Uh, carbon fiber tubes connecting it, so I have no thermal gradients to worry about. After you test it that direction, in the horizontal direction, then you can take the whole device and turn it up or 90 degrees. Now I can test it this way, mm -hmm. and it teeters higher device. Yep. So I can take the effects of both of those. But I do not have the problems that we have with the nine fishes with using that torsional wire. Have you published it, or is there Design? I'd be interested to see your design. All right. Uh, let's go on. Um, now, first, uh, did I, have I addressed John's thing? I, I, John keeps, he's hovering in the background. So let, let me describe um, what John was saying. And I, we may have passed over very quickly one of the things that he was um, he wanted me to talk about. In one of the experiments with uh, gravimeter uh, at, at my lab that John was doing, um, he wanted a three-phase, he, he wanted to produce three-phase currents through particular devices. We used resistors as the dummies and some of the other devices as his, of his uh, that he wants to put three-phase current through. 
And he figured, according to the GEM theory, that putting three-phase current um, allows a rotating field to be produced. You have to refer to his theory and ask him what he meant by that. But instrumentally, it meant that um, uh, we had to package up something that would have would allow uh, weight measurements to the parts of a, a, a few tens of micrograms over a, what was it, 50, 50 gram, no, 150 gram mass. Uh, that's a, a reasonably stiff uh, requirement for a regular analytical balance, which was what he wanted to use. So we couldn't have wires powering this whatever it was to make the three-phase current, like three wires coming into it, because it was too stiff, the current was too great. So we had to package the whole thing up in a battery-powered system. So we had a bunch of uh, NICADs uh, and in a, in a hermetic, what we thought was a hermetically sealed chamber uh, or a little box with, his, with a three-phase uh, uh, current-producing uh, MOSFET circuit and then his, his little three-phase device and that was supposed to be mounted on the balance. Um, we quickly determined or it was quickly determined that we had a wonderful effect. Um, as soon as we, and we had to turn it on with a, uh, uh, I think it was uh, either laser activated or uh, ultrasonic or something like that, because we didn't want any wires to it at all. We had to turn it on and off with, uh, remotely through some kind of electromagnetic influence, like a laser pointer or something. I think that was it. And so we turned it on, and boy, this thing lost weight. And then we turned it off, and it settled back down again. And um, <clears throat> it, th it turned out there were two effects going on. One was that as soon as we turned it on, there was a terrible outgassing of, and I say terrible, but it would be almost invisible to most other people, um, outgassing of the gas produced by the reaction inside the NICAD, in, in the NICAD chemistry in the batteries. Even though they look very nicely sealed and stuff, there's gas coming out all the time and little jets here and there. Um, that was the first effect that made the thing lighter because the gas would seep through little cracks in the box that we had not been able to completely uh, seal up. The other effect was that it changed the, essentially the moment of inertia, uh, or the, sorry, the uh, uh, center of mass, pardon me. Gas would pool in one side of the box, um, and e so even if you did account for and seal everything up perfectly, there would be a stratification and gas would, would move just because of the construction of the, of the box to one side or to top or I can't remember which way, and just slightly affect the, uh, the motion of the balance so you'd think, ah, there's an effect, hey, John's right. So, that, uh, that was basically, I think, what he was getting at. Um, a lot of stuff is done in liquids, a lot of weight measurements in, in cryogens in particular. Um, and uh, there's a heck of a lot of water vapor also in cryogenic systems. There's water vapor everywhere. It's awful. It's dreadful. I hate water vapor, especially when it's in vacuum systems. And that'll be in another slide. That's why I'm going through it very quickly. But uh, there's surface tension effects that, that um, especially when you're lifting a superconductor out of a, out of a cryogen, um, and you think, wow, there's, there's this sudden reduction as I'm lifting it out, and it's uh, changing its state. But it's actually a surface tension effect that the, that the cryogen has been stuck to the bottom. Um, let's go on, please. There are 
lots of, lots of other effects here. Um, and there, someone brought up uh, what I would call temporal effects, a mismatch between the time scale of the measuring device and the time scales of the experiment that is underway. Uh, next, please. I hope we get into, okay. See, we're only on number three, and there's six in this list. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to go through. We'll give you the extra 20, but we'll break at noon. So if you want to gauge your... Is that all right for people? I, I can zip through this really quickly, because you'll get it. But um, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Um, look at this. Sudden release of trapped magnetic fields in superconductors. You don't normally. There, you'd think that there's no trapped magnetic fields after um, transition temperature, but eventually they do bubble up, you might say, and uh, will we'll cause an interaction, a force interaction between any uh, magnetizable bodies in their vicinity. Uh, this is another thing that bugs me a lot, over-reliance on magnetic shielding materials. Um, a lot of neophytes consider, well, if I just put, you know, buy some conetic or mu metal material uh, sheets and bend it up into a box and uh, cover my apparatus or my, my test device, that will be an effective magnetic shield. That's all I need to do. Hey, that's what this says in the book. You use you know, some kind of magnetic shield and the easiest is to just get some sheets of mu metal from a, the mu metal store, bend stuff up, and then maybe put some tape around it or something like that. And assume that that has shielded you uh, from magnetic influences. Well, it hasn't. Um, certainly hasn't shielded you from any static magnetic or slowly time varying magnetic changes. It will shield you from your experiment from, from magnetic fields that change in a particular frequency band, but not all. So, as I say, exclusion of DC or quasi-DC uh, magnetic fields. The other thing people fail to read when, you know, do engineers read instructions? No, they just take the thing and off the shelf and put it in their, in their uh, experiment. Well, the instructions if you read the fine print, say, on the mu metal, once you've bent and formed this sheet into the final shape, you've got to re-anneal it. You've got to hydrogen anneal it if you want it to maintain the shielding effect that, it, that you bought it for, namely the published specs. Who does that? Who has a hydrogen annealing system? So you just accept the fact that, well, yeah, I'll just bend her up, I'll munch it up. If you ever played with this stuff, it's stiff. You try to bend it, and it'll make another crease here, and, and then you have to hammer it out, or you wiggle it around. And it's at those corners that you've bent where most of the, the problematic magnetic fields will come in. Unfortunately, if you want to really, you either have to multiply put multiple sheets of the stuff around, which costs more and, and weighs more and is more complicated to get at, or you have to hydrogen anneal it. Anyway, let's go on to the next one. Can you pop that? Thanks. Oh boy. Uh, improperly sealed Faraday cages and all, all of this. There's too much reliance on the assumption that if I just put a screen, a copper screen around my experiment, I've excluded all uh, electrical field influences. Not the case. Um, we've had a lot of uh, issues with sealing up large chambers. With small chambers, is sometimes not as much of a, a problem. But if you have a walk-in chamber, that uh, you're hoping to remove all the influences, electromagnetic, uh, so primarily electric I'm talking about here, um, you have to be 
really careful. We have a screen room uh, that is about a quarter the volume of this whole space. And it's, and the, the only way we could, could get it down to the specs that I needed was to find, it was, it's a doubly shielded room. The outside is galvanized steel, the outer shell. The inner shell is copper, copper sheet. It's separated by uh, wood. It's on a wood structure. And to make sure that it was as quiet as possible, we had to line the inside with cones, with uh, um, uh, anechoic cones, RF cones. We had to go to great lengths to find every little spot with a sniffer antenna where external um, radiation would come in. It was a real bear. So just because you walk into a really fancy, high-class, multi-million dollar RF screen room and assume that the electromagnetic effects you don't want to influence your experiment aren't there, test it first. Get a sniffer at the, an antenna at the, uh, the uh, frequencies you're worried about and make sure that they're below, uh, the, the, the field intensity is below what you're hoping for. George, is that a problem with just the construction? Like if you had a perfect sphere of copper, would it be a perfect Faraday cage? Or it would be a perfect Faraday cage depending on uh, penetration or skin depth. Mm -hmm. So frequencies that are really low are going to go right through perhaps. I mean, and, and this is not, I mean, for each material and each uh, or alloy, in fact, there is a, a skin depth, or there should be a skin depth. So why you had the copper and the steel, why you needed two of them? Well, there, there is a, there's, a, there's a reason for that. Uh, not only, well, the, the steel is a good magnetic shield. The copper is a good electrostatic or electric shield. So you get the benefit of both. The, the outer shield also, the galvanized is also a good electrostatic shield. So it does a double duty on the front and then uh, at the outside and then just inside you get an extra amount of shielding for electric fields by means of the copper inner. And Lindgren produced, this is a Lindgren uh, shield room that's commercially available shield room. Uh, actually, I have to admit, I bought it on eBay. 8,000 bucks. It's amazing. And the floor too. And the floor too. Ooh boy. And, and the floor has to be level. And if you have a slight mismatch in the floor, uh, because it's double shielded, <laughs> you've got two layers. And they, they can't be like that. They can't be like that. Anyway, that, that's, that was my little nightmare. Next, please. Thanks to Jay Woodward, who was going to check, but never got back to me on this, something called the Lorentz air effect. <laughs> which you can read there. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this. Yep. Maybe three, four more minutes. Yes, okay. Yep. You can read about that. There's lots of ways that, that ex electromagnetic uh, radiation will couple to your experimental, your instrument leads. You've got to put, if you're using pulsed power, man, you've got to be so careful of get a pickup especially if you're in the uh, nanosecond uh, rise time uh, ranges, everything's gonna be, act as an antenna. So you gotta put things in steel, uh, best is in, in, galvan in, in black pipe, just water pipe. Put your, uh, your uh, BNC, your cables, your RG cables or whatever instrumentation cables in black pipe and ground the black pipe. Yes, next please. There, I talk about grounding too. Um, poor and loose connections is a, something that most people don't need to clamp the hell out of it and hope that that's a good connection. And then a couple of days later, uh, they found, gee, that alloy, that copper alloy isn't matched with that copper alloy and there's a bit of electro, uh, electrolytic effect between the two and that's a little resistance and then it nullifies the effect that you're hoping for, the grounding effect. Uh, next, please. Uh, one that really bugs 
me in doing a lot of uh, vacuum work is this thing. Surface charges on water patches. Uh, no matter how good your vacuum system, no matter how long you bake it, you'll always have little bits of water stuck to the inside. It's just impossible to get rid of, unfortunately. And each of those is, an, is a, a dielectric and it accumulates charges. And if they're big enough, if you haven't done your pumping down long enough, that will act as, a, as an electrostatic attractor or repeller, depending on, on what charge is sitting on the surface. <coughs> Next, please. Ion, okay, ion wind, that's, a, you know, the, the uh, Biefeld Brown uh, experiment was fraught with ion wind problems. Uh, charged leakage, trichal pulses or trickle pulses, depending on how you call it, uh, are not usually known, but they come off um, insulators, even in bursts. They're called trickle pulses. You can take a look. Um, and they're especially problematic at sharp corners, so you have these little bursts of corona and they affect uh, and they can push against um, devices that are mounted on sensitive balances. Next, please. Uh, this should be pretty obvious, but lots of people forget. Measurement outside the specifications or using the wrong instrument and all that stuff we talked about a little bit before. Next, please. That should be pretty obvious. And finally, I would like to just make sure that I acknowledge some folk and everyone else who wants to contribute will not be acknowledged as well, should you wish to contribute to this, this list. Next, please. I was going to go, if I had time, into my concerns about that. <laughs> Next, please. And I have some questions about that. But we can get at that because I'm running out of time. Can we uh, take a couple minutes uh, and drive? <laughs> maybe maybe at, at lunch, I don't know. Okay. Um, well, actually, why don't we go through the rest? And if people want to come back, the, the rest is pretty simple, but it's more about this gentleman right here. Um, I published this paper in uh, RSI, Review of Scientific Instruments, back in well, last year on a sub-micronewton thrust balance and of novel design. It had pivot bearings. There was a jewel, uh, a sapphire cup, V-shaped cup, and there was a carbide pivot, like in a so-called Darsonval meter movement that you used to play with as kids. You know, the meters would go like that, have two cups this way and two pivots that way, and the meter arm goes like that, or like this, if you have the pivot this way. So I move that around to have two pivots in two cups on an arm swinging this way. And that's the basis of this balance here. I've never seen anyone do it before. Maybe they knew something I didn't. Uh, next, please. So here's a picture of the balance in general. It's in this vacuum chamber here. Some instrumentation here associated with it. Uh, lots of doodads and, and business there. Next, please. Um, if you read the paper, you'll know what this is about. The inside of the balance, here's the main column here, and the two pivots are in here. And the lever arm is here. It's carbon fiber. And there's all sorts of balancing stuff because inside the vacuum chamber, once it's in there, and it's on, this whole thing is on a pneumatic table. So you pump up the pneumatic table and you don't know whether the thing is like that or it's like that or the balance is like that. So you have to have some method of writing the balance when it's under vacuum on a pneumatic table after the table's been pumped up. So that's what all this business is for here. Next, please. Here's a rear view. We have a um, DVD, a, a plasma thruster uh, being tested here. That was actually published as well. Um, anyway, we have gallon stand, gallon stand uh, connectors 
and uh, methods of zeroing the balance. Um, next, please. Uh, it's just more uh, close-ups of how the, there's a neato torsion spring up at the top that can bring the balance into a center position. Next, please. And there's a, a significant thing being tested right there. You see that significant thing? <laughs> There'll be a new significant thing being put in the balance soon. <laughs> Next, please. This is the kind of signal we get from this balance. This is that, that um, dielectric barrier thruster I just showed you the picture of before, not Jim's, but the dielectric barrier thruster. And we get a, for some reason, a really clean signal. I've seen uh, all these jigglies and jagglies and stuff, and for some reason, um, this is a six micronewton uh, a thrust signal, and uh, we can get down to the sub micronewton. Uh, I think it's uh, 0 0.05 uh, uh, micronewton. Next, please. Six micronewton with what uh, thruster? With what, sorry? The six micronewton was with what thruster? That was a, called a dielectric barrier thruster. If you go back several slides, you'll see it. Um, Jim's old worn-out thruster <laughs> gives us about 0.2 micronewtons uh, in a magnetic shielded thing um, in about 20 microns of vacuum. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Oh.